Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Ginsburg, and I'm your facilitator for the evening. Uh, I'm an aging GP, uh, born and trained in the UK. I've been in Australia for about 45 years, and I'm speaking to you from Gamarigal land, north of Sydney. And uh, welcome to the, um, at least some of the 2,300 people who have registered and some will have joined us for tonight's webinar, uh, Trauma-Informed Care with Older Australians. And uh, welcome also uh, viewers who will be watching the recording. I'd also like to say a special welcome to the members of the Sydney North Older Persons Mental Health Network, that's a mouthful, of which I'm a co-coordinator, and to other networks around Australia who are meeting tonight to watch this broadcast. Uh, MHPN currently supports six older persons mental health networks across the country, and details of these networks and how to join them will be listed in the closing slides. So we'll just go on to the, the next slide here. Get the, get the cursor to work. There we go. So this webinar is the result of a unique partnership between 31 Australian primary care networks and the Mental Health Professionals Network. And in a first in their history, the 31 PHNs performed a consortium mm -hmm. and engaged MHPN to plan, produce and broadcast webinars focusing on older Australians and mental health. And I'll be facilitating all of these webinars. And tonight is the first of the second series. We've had a series of three. Some of you may have seen them. And uh, the PHNs have agreed to continue the series due to its success. So it's a bit like uh, Netflix. We get on to series two. More webinars will be delivered in the next 18 months. So uh, keep an eye out for them. Uh, this might be a good time to use the chat room to say hello to each other, share the name of the land on which you're beaming in from for this national webinar. The um, panelists' bios were posted when you registered. Here we all are, and you can see them all on the screen now. So I'd like to begin by handing over to Judy for an acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Judy. I'd like to ask us all to think about where we're sitting in the different parts of where we are in this land we now call Australia. I'm sitting in the Widgeable, Wyable land of the Greater Bundjalung Nation um, in northern New South Wales. And I'd like to give a welcome from the elders of past and present, but more particularly the people and the children of this place. So wherever you are, think of the children that are the heritage, hold the heritage of where we're all going uh, into the future. So I welcome. I also acknowledge the ancestors, the elders, the people of this place, and the youth and the children who are going to carry the vision of who we are forward. I'm speaking from Wizable Wyable Land, and I'd like you to think of uh, where you are and to name those people where you are at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you very much. Well, you know. I'll pause for a moment for us to reflect on that because the next slide is a, a little bit uh, uh, more digital in mm -hmm. its content. Yeah. Uh, I won't go through um, all of these. Um, I encourage you to use the chat room. Yeah. Um, by registering, you've automatically agreed to the ground rules. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Which can also be found in the Supporting Resources tab. Thank you for sending in over 200 questions. So we've had to edit them down. Please don't take offense if your question is not um, 
were one of the chosen questions. They were all excellent, and oh, that we had, you know, half a day to sit together and have a jolly good yarn about about things. But we've um, whittled them down to a handful for the Q and A section, which will be coming up in a moment. We're not presenting a case study, as I'm sure many narratives will emerge. Uh, I hope to, that the Q&A session will go to the core of what the webinar wants to achieve. Encourage practitioners who provide support and care across sectors, primary care, mental health and community to work collaboratively and assertively together in their work with older people. And I always you know, stress that word with, and I think it's, it's so important. Um, I think we all try and do things with not two or four. Um, there are the learning outcomes. I think everyone's familiar these days with learning outcomes. Um, it's a lot to achieve in 45 minutes on such a broad and complex uh, uh, field. But uh, I'm going to start by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and their work. And as I say, their bios are in there in your registration pack. So, um, uh, Judy, would you like to come back and just for five minutes or so, just give yes. give us a, a bit of an idea? Of so, first of all, I'm a Yemen, Bundjalung woman with also Anglo Celtic and German heritage. And by choice, I had decided to focus on children in the work I do. I have a PhD which looked at violence trauma in communities uh, in Queensland, particularly in Cape York. So focusing on children is really interesting because once I focus on children, I'm actually also sitting with uh, the grannies and the granddads and the older people in the community. Um, and that, in fact, is my, my life vision at the moment, is just to hear the stories that are coming out. Uh, I have um, a number of children and grandchildren of my own. I've just spent some time with my son in Brisbane, which gave me great joy in the way that I saw him interacting with uh, the 95-year-old uh, the man across the road, uh, just sitting and talking with him. So this describes who I am. Uh, I'm a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, but more particularly, I'm particularly, particularly as an Aboriginal woman concerned for our children. Uh, they're the future this country. I'd like to uh, stop now and, and uh, just hand over to Duncan or whoever else wants to now talk. Well, that's a good segue, Duncan. Okay, well thank you Judy and thank you Stephen and hello everybody. It's great to be here with you all tonight. My name's Duncan McKellar. Um, I'm a psychiatrist specialising in the care of older people and I'm coming to you tonight from Adelaide. So I'm on Ghana country the traditional custodians of the Adelaide Plains. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to be part of this webinar this evening. In my work as a psychiatrist, specialising in the care of older people, um, one of the, the groups of people, the populations or the groups of people that I work a lot with are people with dementia. And in particular, as a psychiatrist, I work with people who experience really quite severe to extreme psychological and behavioural symptoms that result from living with dementia. And so this is a particular population that really are very close to my heart and I spend a lot of time with. And um, so one of the things that, that perhaps we'll talk about as we, we move through is the impact of trauma in that population and how for people with dementia, trauma is really important to be thinking about. I think one of the questions that we're, we're to start sort of thinking about at the beginning of tonight is what is trauma-informed care and what does it mean to us? What does it mean to me as a psychiatrist? And I suppose uh, for me, trauma-informed care is a really fundamental part of the way that I think about my work as a psychiatrist, but also um, my interactions with other people as a human being. And one of the things that I think we, we, we need to be very aware of as we interact in systems of care in health and social care is that anyone who comes into that system, whether it be somebody who comes in in order to receive care 
or whether it's somebody who's actually in that system delivering care, is that any one of those people may be carrying with them the impact of trauma within their experience. And that trauma can then um, play out in all sorts of ways in the therapeutic and the, the interpersonal interactions that occur within that system for that person and the people that they're working with. And this is as important for people who receive care as it is for those who deliver care because um, depending on which study you read, it's anywhere between 55 and 90% of the population have experienced significant trauma within their lives at some point in time. And so for me, thinking about trauma-informed care is a fundamental component of us moving forward and, and doing our work and living our lives as clinicians and as human beings. And the other thing I'll say before I hand over to Johanna is um, that I work with older people. And one of the things that really strikes me when we think about trauma, we often do think about uh, younger stages of the lifespan. Um, and what often happens for, for older people is that we can minimalise the trauma that, that may have impacted their lives and how that might actually impact them. Um, there are things that happen in older life uh, that we we just take as a normal part of ageing. So take, for instance, things like forced relocation. Well, think about moving into residential aged care, for instance, and that, that becomes a forced relocation oftentimes for people. Um, acquiring a disability. So think about the onset of, of um, frailty in older age, um, of physical disability, of cognitive changes. These are all potentially significantly traumatic changes for older people. Uh, think of losing a life partner. Um, and there's something that often happens, I, and I, I see this a lot of the time, where when something happens for an older person, we tend to minimalise, oh, that's part of getting older. Um, and we can, we, we can fail to, to recognise how significant an impact that might be on that person's life and how traumatising that would be. Now, if that, if that same event happened to somebody who was 35 or 40, we would see it as a tremendous uh, trauma, as a tremendous um, imposition upon their life and their well-being. And it's an interesting to think about when we come to this idea of trauma-informed care for older people is how easy it is to slip into societal ageist kind of ways of thinking that actually marginalise and minimise the impact of trauma on older people. And that's where I'll leave it for my starting comments. Thank you. Uh, Johanna. Well, thank you. Um, so um, welcome everyone. It's so nice to be with you all this evening. Um, I'm, I'm a GP and I'm calling in from Kwandamuka country, the eastern uh, suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, I'm a GP who spent the last 15 years of my uh, working life working with adults who've survived childhood trauma and neglect. And as Duncan was speaking, I was thinking of a patient that taught me such a key uh, lesson about trauma-informed care. She was a uh, woman in her 70s, and her um, event that had really frightened her was being locked inside a cupboard while she was playing hide-and-seek as a little girl. And all these years later, there was uh, something that was really still distressing her. And I guess I come to trauma, the sort of uh, concept of trauma-informed care as a GP who uh, has witnessed many people's stories telling me about events that other people would have written off as not traumatic. Uh, but for her as a little girl, she thought nobody was going to find her and that she might die in the cupboard. And it had been tormenting her for decades. And uh, her message to me really was that the traumatized person gets to decide if it was traumatizing, not some artificial DSM diagnostic framework uh, that was usually written by somebody wanting to minimize their insurance costs. And um, that um, when we are with people, it takes time to get them to be in a place where they feel safe enough even to tell us about things that they might find shameful or distressing about their, their life stories. So I come to this space of trauma-informed care after years of working here 
with a strength-based approach, thinking that our main goal when we're with people is how we help them to feel safe in the world again. Uh, we don't have a job of being a journalist or a, a judge, um, making sure we've, uh, what some people say, taken the history from someone. And I had a lovely person remind me we, we, we receive a history from the people we listen to. Uh, mm. And so there's this um, place of sitting with um, and holding suffering while we help people to feel safe again in the world. Uh, I've just uh, completed a PhD that looked at distress um, because we sometimes divide human distress and suffering into little diagnostic boxes. That means we miss the deep story of what's been going on for the person. And so I went to my PhD with a question from my community, which was how do we help people to feel safe again? And looking at a shared language that crosses disciplines called sense of safety. And I asked uh, the respondents from that process um, two main questions. What causes threat and how do you sense that you're safe? And what came from that is a really broad understanding of uh, people's environment. A lot of people talked about injustice and uh, the processes of racism and dispossession of country. And, you know, I hope tonight we'll get a chance to focus and learn from Judy around the experience of stolen generation um, elderly people. And uh, so that place of, uh, of environment, um, including connection to the land, uh, that Duncan kind of uh, uh, gave us a hint about when we get moved and translocated without our, our wishes. Uh, and then noticing the, the centrality of relationships and how people relate to one another and how traumatizing we can be towards one another by ignoring or disconnecting just as much as we can when we invade or confuse one another. Uh, and how our bodies are a place where we can feel distress from pain, from illness, from frailty. Um, and uh, again, this is something that's really important for us to notice, as Duncan alluded to earlier. And I guess I'm also interested in my work in general practice so with, with how people treat themselves, what they think of themselves and how they talk to themselves, because we can traumatize ourselves on the inside by how we minimize or dismiss or attack ourselves. Uh, and what we sense and perceive in our bodies and our inner experiences, our memories are such a part of us. And when we only focus on thoughts and we only focus on thoughts or memories that have been made overt or explicit, we miss out on the memories that are hidden inside our bodies. And of course, how people make meaning and how they, they face spiritual things, which becomes sometimes more distressing as we age, existential distress that can be quite traumatizing. So I guess I come to this as a generalist who wants to help us see this wide picture and watch for patterns of how people heal and how we as human beings, no matter what kind of profession we come from, could um, do a little bit more in that space to, to respect and honor and include seeing the strengths. You know, post-traumatic growth is a whole area of study. And so the strengths of those who have survived traumatic things that we can honor in the older people in our community would be where I'd end there. Thank, thank you, Johanna. That was, uh, that was uh, a lovely description of your work and your life. Um, <laughs> and it reminds me of uh, something once taught me. Uh, always, always think of compassion for one's own chronic disorder. <laughs> and, uh, mm. it's, that can be helpful um, and another thought that came up while you were talking was um, I don't want to recommend TV programs but um, currently there is on Netflix a, a series called Made mm. which when you said cupboard it mm -hmm. you know I thought hmm uh, Duncan's mm. nodding his head perhaps you've seen it but a cupboard plays a very large part in in the story, and, mm. and it is about trauma and uh, and how it sits in us. So, so if if any any of you out there are, are Netflix watchers, watchers um, I think it could almost be used as a teaching tool. I've been very impressed by it. So moving on. Um, as a schoolboy, I was uh, always told to look up a word in the dictionary, even if I thought I knew what it meant. 
so uh, the other day I looked up trauma and uh, uh, my dictionary tells me that it's the Greek it comes from the Greek word for wound uh, but its use for and I quote a disturbing experience such as to cause a mental shock dates from a reference in psychoanalysis from 1918 so uh, the, that dictionary is pretty careful in trying to find out when uh, a word has been used for the first time in language in the English language so can I ask each of you and perhaps start with you Judy uh, what is your understanding of the meaning of trauma and um, as one of the questions that came into us uh, how do you approach trauma-informed care now you've described some of that uh, but gives you a, a wide open field to say a little and then we'll each okay. give your um, your view on that so first of all trauma is embodied and quite often and I'm now talking specifically about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people with a cold background uh, quite often it's about history and I just want to describe something that I experienced in a hospital to um, bring my point forward. I had a fall and not so long ago, a couple of years ago, so I was in my 70s, I had the fall and I was taken to hospital. And beside me in the room beside me was an elder Aboriginal woman um, at my age, but the nurses had decided that she had dementia. And as I sat and listened to her, I uh, found my way into her room to sit beside her. It struck me in a very painful way that what she was acting out was some very, very painful childhood experiences. She had been removed as a child and placed in institutions and she had experienced sexual abuse and other forms of abuse. And she was acting this out in different ways that only made sense to somebody who knew the history. Now, I think what I'm, I'm, I'm naming here is not just for Aboriginal people. Um, trauma is embodied, it's, it's generational, it's memories, and it's the experiences that have been passed down. But in this case, this woman had been removed as a child, but also people who come from other countries, uh, who come from war zones to live in, in this place we now call Australia, will have memories and experiences of extreme trauma, which can't be expressed because people don't want to hear it. People do not in this country want to hear the experiences of Aboriginal people um, from a massacre, from a war zone, uh, from children, be uh, children being placed into care and then being seriously harmed. And what happens as we get old, those memories become stronger within us and we act them out. Um, so trauma is uh, generational. And I'm talking about Aboriginal people and I'm talking about people from other countries, cult. Um, it's generational. Uh, it can be developmental in the case of this older woman who had these incredibly distressful and, and traumatic experiences as a child of being abused in many different ways when she was placed in care, the care of the state or coming from a war zone if you're coming from another country. It can... Um, be complex in the way that we uh, don't understand ourselves sometimes what we're uh, experiencing, what we're living with. My background history from my own family is uh, survival on my uh, great grandmother's side of the Hornet Bank massacre. Uh, and I've just come back from place in New South Wales uh, where we were talking about what was happening and how the children were acting out in the school. Um, some pretty uh, distressing. Uh, behaviors and then sitting with their not their parents because generally they weren't with their parents their grandparents and the shock and the distress and the shame that was in the the grandparents experiences and on the way home uh, as I was driving home with the, uh, the psychiatrist who was working with me um, he said what is this and I said do you know the history of this place and he said well I've read and then he named the books so on not I'm not going to name the book because I don't want to have your an understanding of the location of what I'm talking about. And he uh, he said, you know, there was this big massacre. And I said, yes, there was. And what else happened? And he couldn't answer me. 
And I said, go back and read the book and you will find that at the time of the massacre, they raped the women and the children as well, the girl children and the boy children. And that is being acted out now. And I'm then referring to that woman uh, in that uh, hospital bed. And the nurse was talking about her as though she was a problem and she had dementia. And I said, okay, let's just go back together and we'll sit and have a talk and just see if you can hear the stories that she holds deep within her body of what happened to her as a child when she was removed and placed in, placed in state care. And when we left that time, the, nurse, the two nurses said to me, my God, I had never thought of that. So I guess I'm wanting us to think about these things and how we start to respond to them in ways that we make no judgment, but we are responding in deep therapeutic ways. What's the story here underneath the pain? How do we respond to that story? How do we respond yep. to that pain? Thank you. Yep. So, Johanna, do you want to uh, give us a, an insight into uh, your understanding of the meaning of trauma? Yes, well, I actually have been influenced by Judy in my thinking around trauma. And she has a beautiful phrase that she says, behavior is language. And mm. uh, I guess my sense is that uh, for those of us thinking around dementia and um, times of life where it's difficult to put things into words, um, that uh, key thing that Judy mentioned there about it being embodied is something that we can take forward with us, I think. I also um, reflect on the word wound when I think about trauma because I think it just brings it back to a human understanding of the word rather than a what might be a more medicalized use of the language or perhaps a more technical use of that word that I think then disconnects us from what we as ordinary people can do to help. And it becomes like a specialized area of work that mm -hmm. um, uh, although I know there are that the specialized work of learning how to care for the severely traumatized is a special skill set that requires ongoing training and supervision. I also don't want our community to lose the skill of sitting with one another's wounds. And uh, I, in my thesis asked, um, when I asked what causes threat, uh, there were three key themes of what makes people feel um, threatened. And one was feeling invaded and um, that's not just invaded it's not given being trapped in some way uh, and the second was feeling disconnected from other people and so this one's something that often gets missed when we use the word trauma to mean an event where somebody hurt us with a like a car accident or a rape or a um, yeah. Uh, and so disconnection from other people, but also from land and from ourselves. We can get disconnected from our own bodies in the way we are, are in the world. And uh, so uh, that's, that's another key area where we can um, experience traumatizing. And then the third is when things are really confusing. Um, and that can happen when we grow up somewhere where there's no rhythms or routines or where there's intoxication of some sort that makes people unpredictable or um, emotions that aren't regulated and so you, the people around you react at times you don't expect them or they switch or dissociate in front of you. Um, but it can also happen with intentional confusion like gaslighting that happens in domestic violence where people's own intuitions are intentionally groomed to be, uh, they no longer trust them up their own gut. Um, so for me, trauma, we need to remember it's not just an event and we don't, we're not sort of picking through people's life stories to find events that were traumatizing. They can be deep, emotionally distressing processes that happen between us and other people that um, we may not even pick up as being something that's unusual if we've lived with it our whole lives. I'll often find people who've been experiencing emotional neglect and yet they would think, um, I don't need to be here. There are other people who are more, more need, needy than me um, because I wasn't raped. Um, and yet for those who've never received kindness and compassion and connection, they're extremely difficult to treat with, um, with, uh, because they're, they're not used to human beings providing something safe for them. Um, so I, I guess my sense is, again, to keep this vision that 
um, trauma is anything where we lose our sense of safety in the world. Um, it's, it's a, I use it as a code for, in medical language, it's a paradigm shift for no, mm. not get, not getting yep. caught up with, with trying to get yep. diagnostic labels and, um, look for cure, um, and put some people into diag sort of diagnostic classifications that were, have lots of holes in them scientifically. Um, and instead to be focusing on comforting and caring for the people that we're with. Yeah, yeah. I remember reading somewhere, we are our wounds. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think um, those those comments are wonderful, actually. And just to sort of echo, I guess, Johan, what Johan has just been saying, I think one of the things to... Um, to really be mindful of in terms of trauma-informed care is the degree of subjectivity that exists in the concept of trauma. And, and I really think that's what, what Joanna's, Johanna's talking about when she's saying um, you can't just sort of sift through somebody's life looking for the events because there's such a myriad number of events that can actually be experienced as a source of trauma for people. And it's really about the impact of those events on that person and on their um, psychological and physical well-being and their resilience and their um, whether they feel um, whether their sort of sense of being able to cope with that that experience is overwhelmed um, and so what I think that means for us is that we really need to then think about how we come to people with a curiosity and um, an openness to listen to their story and to understand what has occurred for them. So um, we're sort of asking about what, is, what has happened in your life rather than sort of this, this sort of more diagnostic idea of, well, what's wrong with you and how can we fix that? So I think that recognising that trauma is very broad and it is very subjective in, in, in that it is, it's really about what is the impact of these experiences for this person um, and what might be overwhelming for one person might not be overwhelming for another but we really mm -hmm. need to be mindful that 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 doesn't negate or reduce the the, the potency of that experience and that uh, for that person who has been overwhelmed by something um, and Stephen you know not to, not that we want to spend all night at, in Netflix but if we come back to your um, reference to that uh, what is actually a really wonderful um, limited series made it's really from a from a fantastic book uh, written from um, you know the, the the author's own experience as a, a single mom and a, and a victim of domestic violence one of the things that really struck me in that that story was how um, the central character really struggles with this idea that she's been traumatised simply because she actually hadn't been hit by her domestic partner. Uh, and so there's some really quite powerful scenes where she's interacting with, with uh, some of the people that are sort of trying to work out how would they help her. Uh, and she's sort of saying, but I'm, I'm you know, essentially saying, but I'm not a victim of trauma because I haven't met a certain set of criteria. And I think that just brings us home to this idea that actually trauma is diverse and it is broad and it's really very, very subjective in terms of it's about what has the impact been on that individual. Yep, yep. No, well, thank you. Um, one of the questions that came in was what are your strategies to help an older person unpack their trauma? We, you've given us some clues on that. But particularly, when should you not, in inverted commas, go there? Mm. Uh, I'd love to jump in on that one, Stephen. Yes, I, 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 I thought, oh, that's one of those trauma-informed myths that we have to unpack things. Uh, yep. And I'd yep. say it's not. It's definitely not about unpacking. Uh, mm. And uh, for me, it's around again the main goal being trying to help someone feel safe in the current circumstances that they're in. And and now that might be quite difficult if they've just been transported into a nursing home or they are um, have have just had a loss of their their partner of 40 years or. Um, have you know watching something happening to their grandchild that they're finding very distressing 
So I, I guess I would be saying what our task is to be looking wide at their current environment, you know, where they're sitting and what they can see and hear and learn from and their current relational environment uh, and being quite wary of families that um, look very well behaved at the end of the bed but actually have are not at all helpful in other settings. And so um, trauma-informed care of older Australians is also being aware of how they might be currently being traumatised by people in their, in their family and circumstances. Uh, and then, you know, wanting to know about their memories and if there's anything that's bothering them there to let them talk or not, depending on how they're feeling. But to me, the whole goal is that we're trying to make whatever they're experiencing inside, whether it's their nightmares or dreams or, or um, things coming into their mind, unbidden images, um, that we're trying to help them feel safer about that, about who they are as they reflect back on their life mm. and have regrets or things didn't turn out how they wanted, uh, as well as those sort of deeper existential questions. So for me, the goal is to help them feel safe enough to grieve what really happened to them. Uh, mm. And grieving is a natural process that we all can do if we're feeling safe enough. We get stuck with it if we're not feeling safe. Uh, and so as, as people in the community, I'd say our main goal is to help people feel safe enough to, to say the things they need to say and uh, feel the things they need to feel uh, in order to feel safer. There's another one of those diagnostic categories, complicated grief. Yes, yeah, and I, I would say complicated grief is grief that has got stuck. Uh, and we, when we normally grieve, beautiful, some Dutch researchers have shown it's a movement. It's a movement between looking at something that we've lost and then looking at restoration, where we're the, the next steps. And we oscillate between those two things as we slowly adjust to acknowledging what's happened to us. And uh, people can get stuck looking at what they've lost or they can get stuck looking at only what's going on at next or they can get stuck paralyzed in between the two, unable to move. Uh, and so providing safety is what helps that, that oscillation to restart. Joanna, and you, I Judy, I'm sure. Oh, there we go. I was about to bring you into the conversation, but you're, you're there, Judy. <laughs> yeah. um, look, I just want to draw out that there, there's a complexity in all this as well. Um, I was asked to do some work after there'd been a group of suicides in young people in a particular part of Australia. And the, the, the most senior member of that family who was 90 in his 90s um, came along to be part of what we were doing. And there were two points I wanted to make. That he said to me at one time after he had shown me the places where I was, I was able to walk and places where I couldn't walk in this country. And uh, there were parts of it that I couldn't walk across because of uh, the, the, the sacredness of it. But he said to me, you can't stop them, you know. And he was talking about the young people who had just completed suicides. He said, we couldn't stop the white men when they came with their guns. And now we can't, can't stop our young people from doing what they're doing. And it was his grand two, two grandsons who had suicided. The point I'm making here was that he felt incredibly powerless um, in every way, in every part of his life. At the same time, the, uh, the, 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 in particular, the, the uh, father of the two young men, he was the grandfather, um, also felt totally powerless, not able to even talk about it to anybody because it was too painful for the elders to hear. Now, I guess what I'm asking us to do is to, to find a way that we can truly, truly listen um, so that what needs to be said can be said and we can hold that space. Grieving happens when people feel safe. Mm -hmm. When the stories may or may not come out, uh, we don't have to have the stories as much as we, we, we respond to the pain that's there. And we make sense of in some way. Uh, loss and grief is a major part of most people's lives, we, we, all of us. And I'm at 78 now, I'm kind of lots of regrets about what I could have done differently in my life. But what I know is that each of us are making sense of the world in which we live. And I'm talking 
specifically about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I'd also like to suggest that those who've come to this country um, uh, as refugees or whatever, that they're bringing those kinds of stories too that are overwhelming at times. And so our capacity or the capacity of all of us to just listen, just listen and hold space, doesn't mean we have to do anything big because sometimes the trauma, the first time the trauma is spoken about is the first time the person themselves has wanted to, been safe enough, enough to express it. And when we respond by just holding space with them and crying, and I've done that, as I did at the bed of that woman that I was talking about, with the two nurses beside me as they came to an understanding that she was acting out something she'd never expressed before in her life, of things that had happened to her as a child. Um, and again, the, the, the elder that I just referred to, he's deep, deep, embodied sense of powerlessness. We couldn't stop the white men with their guns. We can't stop our young people now today putting a rope around their neck. Um, I think it's how we can sit and listen and hold space um, and speak. And for me personally, and this may sound crazy as a, a professional, that's one of the greatest tools I've had was to be able to cry with somebody. Mm -hmm. sit and listen and then cry together. And then see them starting to plan what they want to do. And I'll just finish by saying this, is that um, in each case that I've talked about, um, with the woman, you know, that I was talking about, she asked if we could sit and just talk about the rug on her bed, for example, that somebody had crocheted for her, and the different colours in the rug, and that she never had anything beautiful when she was a child. And that rug meant so much to her. And the nurses never had a thought that, you know, a rug that somebody had crocheted and given to her would have meaning um, when they had just decided that she was just an old woman with dementia. And back with uh, the other place I talked about, uh, that, that, that old man of 90 in his 90s sat with his um, son-in-law and they cried together. Um, when they started to talk about the, the loss of life of two of the, the grandsons and the sons of that, uh, the grandson of the older man and, 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 and shared how they wanted to make some kind of um, changes, go out and talk about domestic violence, talk about the things that they can do uh, to create, bring back culture, the old fellow was talking about, bring back culture. Um, I wonder, I, I, I don't think it's complex, I think it's, our capacity to, uh, to create safe places for stories to come, to be able to hold those stories. And I want to put, uh, you know, like this is complex trauma, this is developmental trauma. I'm, I'm asking is that we just hold those stories and sit with people as they grieve together um, and they start to make sense themselves of what they can do with each other. The loss and grief is immense. Sometimes the trauma is conflicted by the immense layers of loss and grief in people's lives and I'm talking again I just want to make this point point I'm talking specifically about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander the people who have lost so much yeah. and finally we reclaim we, we reclaim our capacity to grieve and celebrate and heal together I mm. just want to be with you. Yeah, that's a very powerful moment of, of your compassion thank you Thank you, Judy. Can I pitch a question to you, Duncan? The one that's come in. Um, the question says, I work in psychogeriatrics, providing inpatient care for patients with dementia experiencing BPSD. I always have to think what those letters mean, behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. Often yes. these behaviors are a result of or indicate past traumas, especially in early life, that are triggered by being in nursing care and which are not easily expressed by the person with dementia. Can you provide any insights into how trauma-informed care can augment dementia mm. care? And Judy's touched on this more than touched uh, on this. Yes, experience. no, she, she's absolutely set it up beautifully for me. Um, and I think I'd really, in answering this question, I think the best way is to pick up on Judy's point around it's, it's really in the story of the person and, and there's no substitute for actually listening um, and connecting with the person's story. And I think that 
Look, I, I, I wouldn't want to say that all behavioural and psychological symptoms that might um, be experienced by a person living with dementia are due to trauma. However, in my experience, there is a very high prevalence of the impact of trauma that um, is expressed um, in all sorts of ways by a person who's living with dementia. And so the, and the best illustration I can give you is actually a story. So if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you a, a quick story. And this is of a woman called Maisie, who, from whom I learned a tremendous amount. Um, Maisie was born during the Second World War in the UK. She came with her family to Australia after the Second World War as 10 pound poms, as so many people did. Uh, they moved around Australia quite a bit and it was quite a disruptive early life. And they eventually settled in a South Australian coastal town. And what was a, a hidden secret within their family was Maisie's sexual abuse at the hands of her father um, that remained a secret through all of her childhood. Uh, but she grew into a, a, a clever and talented and beautiful young woman. She won um, a beauty contest, uh, always dressed herself you know, with, with great care, uh, married before she was 18, and then had her first of three marriages, um, had three young children by the time she was 22 um, and was already caught in a cycle of domestic violence um, mm. and significant trauma. And, look, and that was repeated numerous times through several relationships in her life. She um, alleviated a lot of her own distress by... Uh, drinking a lot of alcohol, uh, she experienced significant depression. It's not difficult to understand why she would have, uh, and life was difficult. Later on in her in her third and final marriage, for most the most part, it was a much happier time. And then, um, around the time of her father's death, she experienced a lot of sort of revisiting of her own trauma. That was really when that trauma sort of emerged for her from her childhood. And as a result of that, her, her, her third marriage um, fell apart. Around that time, she experienced a significant motor vehicle accident, had, had to have treatment for, for post-traumatic stress disorder. And then just a short time after that, when she was in her early 60s, she started to experience significant cognitive and functional changes and was diagnosed with dementia. And so by the time she was in her mid-60s, she was really not able to live at home very successfully. And she started a, a really difficult journey in and out of hospital, aged care. Um, she was quite estranged from her children because of the impact of their early life um, in such a difficult circumstance. And so she found herself with very few people, members of her family, able to support her. Uh, she had a brother who was very faithful to her. And I met Maisie... Um, it, you know, at the, at the now very shamed Oakton Older Persons Mental Health Service uh, in Adelaide's North, uh, which was, you know, the, this was in, back in 2017 when I was part of the Oakton review panel, um, to writing the Oakton report, which then, of course, became the trigger for the Royal Commission uh, sometime after that. And when I first met Maisie, she was dishevelled, she was, um, she looked like a wildling. She had dried food down the front of her, her um, clothing. She was dressed in mismatched clothes. She, she would spit and, and swear at anybody that came anywhere within her vicinity. She'd really been marginalised and, and written off as this person who was violent and aggressive. But yeah. she was severe BPSD. And that's how she was seen. And that's how she was marginalised within a system. What happened after the Oakton report was, we, you know, that that service was closed. We, I was part of setting up new services in, in Adelaide. And Maisie came, we, when we closed Oakton, she came over to a new service where we were seeking to really learn a much more trauma-informed, much more person-centred way of working. And... What happened was as this, this new st group of staff who were informed by a different set of values started to work with, with Maisie and, and started to be curious about her story and what had happened in her life, we, we uncovered all of this terrible story of, of trauma, of abuse, um, of loss, of grief, of hardship. 
And one of the things that was most difficult for her was um, around the care of personal hygiene. So she had, at, at the worst in her times when she was at, at the Oakton campus, she'd had up to seven people um, holding her limbs and compelling her to be washed. Uh, and, and this was a time of terrible, terrible crisis and trauma for, for the staff, but m m without a doubt for Maisie. And her behaviour was, it wasn't that it was aggressive, it was highly defensive because she was absolutely terrified. And what happened is the staff started to understand this story. They realised that every time they did something with her from a therapeutic, from a supposed caring point of view, they were re-traumatising her. And they were taking her back to all of those bodily yeah. experiences that happened yeah. earlier in her life. And she couldn't, she could no longer express uh, what was happening for her in words. She couldn't understand it. But the, the trauma experience was played out in every one of these behaviours. And as they learnt to give her care differently, so what they would do is they would never unclose her. One person would go to her and would talk quietly and, and calmly about this is what we're going to do to, 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 um, to give you a shower now. And they would keep her always wrapped up in warm towels. They would never unclose her. What happened in a really quite remarkably short space of time is that her whole presentation was transformed. She was no longer dressed like a wildling. Um, and that that young woman who had been so careful about her appearance started to re-emerge. Um, and we rediscovered this beautiful person. Um, she you know, she would, was really underweight. She started to, to eat well, to put on weight. She reconnected with her family. Um, and and despite the fact that dementia had meant that she had lost her language skills, that she'd lost her ability to sort of communicate in normal ways, um, she actually taught uh, our care team so much and transformed the whole sort of paradigm. I love that idea, Johanna's idea of a paradigm shift. She she shifted the paradigm in how we actually looked at the story of the person and what what underpinned behaviors and um and you know her care was transformed but what was more important actually was that the understanding of the person and the way that care was conceptualized and then delivered by a whole team of clinicians was transformed um and it was a truly wonderful experience and it was such a privilege to be in a um, a situation like that where we learnt from the person living with dementia um, and the trigger for that was a curiosity and an openness uh, and a, a sort of attitude of inquiry about wanting to understand and connect with her story. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thank wonderful. you. Thank you so much for that story. It, it's a, a hopeful story. Mm. Uh, and it would be lovely just to to uh, broadcast that into every aged care facility in, in the country. Yeah, so absolutely. It's simple, and it just tells. If yeah, it's that's all a great, great point. Yeah. Simple, in the, in the, simple. You know, it wasn't. There's nothing clever about it at all. It was simply. Nothing. It was very human. I think was the the yeah. wonderful thing. It was about just connecting with another human being, not seeing them as somebody different and other to ourselves, but actually just recognising yeah. it's a human being with a story. Um, and when we, well, when we connect with that story, it changes everything. Well, there's, there's the tip that's mentioned in the uh, learning outcomes. Can, can our audience learn a few tips? Well, there's a tip. A <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, very strong one. So, so that's great. Yeah, Johanna, Johanna, would you like to um, uh, round up your your sort of section by by answering one of the questions that's come in, which is why is it important for our whole community to understand that older Australians might have been traumatised? Ah, uh, look, I think again, building on what um, Duncan is saying there about a paradigm shift, I think. If we don't notice that people have been traumatised, we are at risk of reducing people to objects who might have diagnostic labels attached to them and often many, many labels attached to them when they come to see me. And I, I think as a community, we need to understand the importance of life story and relationships and meaning on our well-being. And unfortunately, the 
the, what I, the reifying, you know, the making into something special of diagnostic naming and uh, the ways that those uh, names are considered valid and the, the capital E evidence we use to, to measure them from outside with objective measures and reducing things so that we can study them and um, means we ignore things that actually are part of making us human, um, ignore where we are, who we're with, and what it means to us. Uh, and so I guess my sense is, uh, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that life story is a key element of how we relate to one another. Mm. And our older Australians have a gift they can give us. They can give us advance warning on how life goes and mm. Um, they can teach us things about how to how to cope with things that are really overwhelming. Um, I noticed um, when um, Duncan was speaking earlier, he talked about overwhelm. You know, when we're overwhelmed from the things that are in our life, that can be traumatizing. And Judy mentioned a man who just really had lost hope that he could ever change something. Uh, and I guess I sense that that our goal is to to um, to, to care for people um, in those places where they've experienced that kind of suffering. Uh, I um, uh, read a, a quote that's attributed to Hippocrates and he says that when we're healers, we, we cure sometimes, we heal often, but we need to console always. Mm. And I guess my sense is consoling is, is something that all Australians can learn how to be towards one another. You don't need a special degree or, or a Medicare item number to be able to deliver consoling to one another. Uh, and it's not just the skill set of a few practitioners. All practitioners should be trauma-informed in how they see the people that they care for. Um, some will be trauma-specific in their training and have skills that we can refer to, but all of us should know who those people are in our neighborhood and be able to um, notice when somebody needs their help. Um, and I guess all people have the capacity to console others in their suffering. And I, I sense that um, this is what us as a community, a, a way of being with our older community means we also notice the strengths that they've endured through their trauma. And so um, I guess I'm, my sense is this is important for us to acknowledge. I, I, was, I leapt at the chance to speak about trauma-informed care for older Australians uh, because it's central to how we as a community treat one another. If we don't notice it in our older people who can speak or who speak through their body, then how, what hope have we to notice in our younger ones who don't feel free to tell us their life? So um, thank you for letting me no. speak. No, no, that's great. I, um, I'm a... Uh been working with the concept of compassionate communities for many years and uh, we we introduced a, a meeting to a large group of people and uh, there was an Aboriginal colleague there and um, we talked and we talked about compassionate communities and at, at the end as she came up to me and she said um, how come you didn't mention that that uh, we lot have been doing compassionate communities for uh, 80,000 years and more. So, mm -hmm. Judy, I, I reckon that uh, we need to learn that consolation, compassion, uh, care for each other from uh, from First Nations people. Would, would you like to uh, uh, speak to that, you know, in, in, in your conclusion on on the uh, on the session? I think that there's two things I'd like to draw out. Um, I think when you're talking about compassionate communities, I'd also like to name that from my experience, there's almost an overwhelm at times because what I'm seeing is uh, our elders who are holding space for the generation, their children, who are also deeply traumatised. So they're holding space for their grandchildren. Um, and so many of our elders are, are bringing up and looking after our grandchildren, their grandchildren. Now, what a compassionate com community is to me, and it's been something that's happened for millennia, is that how people start to then work together. Uh, we've been working a lot on what would be a community of care, a care, 
caring community that looks out for each other and supports each other. Now, that's part of culture. How do we, when people are in overwhelm and the mother or the grandmother or the grandfather who's lost something, how do we hold that space so grieving can happen? Uh, so, so that people can back, go back to the stories that are truly painful. A compassionate community for me is also when we took a, a group of young children into an old people's home in uh, Cairns in, in northern Queensland quite a few years ago. And there was a woman sitting there uh, who couldn't speak. She was very clearly from one of the remote uh, North Queensland Cape York communities. She couldn't speak. She was just sitting there. And the children wanted to engage with her. I'm talking, the Aboriginal children wanted to engage with her. And as they tried to talk to her, her uh, attention came to the faces of the children. I realised that they didn't have her language and she didn't have our language. That in fact she was in an old people's home with no language. None of the teachers could, none of the nurses could engage her. But as the children uh, gathered around her and started to sing to her, sing songs, she started to get a sense of engagement and I wouldn't say the word excitement, but a deep connection. Now, I guess what I'm talking about when you're talking about a compassionate community is that um, across generations, people um, support each other, care for each other and look out for each other. Um, I just keep coming back to uh, the sense, however, in the, the woman I talked about in that uh, hospital bed beside me uh, who couldn't communicate and she'd been wiped, she'd been pushed aside but somebody knitted for her or crocheted for her a, a beautiful rug which she was so so proud of. That's a compassionate community, just somebody seeing something they can do and giving her a gift. A compassionate community is when children see that there's an older person who just needs some love and care so they decided to sit there even though they couldn't speak her language and she couldn't speak English. And they, or at this stage in her life, I'm not quite sure what was the why. Um, but they sang to her and she engaged in the music beautifully. Um, a compassionate community is a community of care, a community that cares for each other. And sometimes we put that care to the expert outside others when in fact it's already there. Um, and my experience is, and I'll leave it at this, is that sometimes the most wounded of us can be the ones that bring caring to others. And in that, we heal together. In the sense that in the points I'm wanting to make about the history that still remains in this country that is still unresolved, still unhealed, um, from the times of first invasion. And the seven and eight generations now I've uh, kind of mapped with deep, deep trauma, the historic trauma, the complex trauma, the developmental trauma in children. Uh, when we come together and we share stories, we hold stories, we heal stories, that's the compassion that we need for each other. But more particularly, it's the compassion we need for ourselves because we're part of the pain and we're part of the healing. Mm. Beautifully said, thank you. It's, um, um, you know, we, we hear all the time about uh, uh, workforce shortages, but uh, you open the space for, of course, the community uh, being the healers as well as the professionals, but you open that space so, so brilliantly. Thank you. Um, so um, we're, we're certainly coming near the end of our time. Duncan, would you like to just say a, a few, a, a few words to sum up from your perspective? Sure. Sure. I, I, I think um, after Judy's such beautiful words, I'm, I'm quite reticent to say anything actually, Stephen, <laughs> but um, look, I suppose if I, I think about this wonderful conversation that I've really enjoyed being part of this evening, um, that idea of, of compassionate community is so important. And one of the things that strikes me is because, you know, we, you know, you, you even just intimated this yourself and we've sort of this 
dichotomy that we have between what is the professional world and who are the helpers um, and those, who are those that are helped. And I just really think we should quite intentionally just break that concept all apart because indeed we are all those who help and we are all those who are helped um, because we're all just the same. We're, we're humans making our way through life yeah. together. And um, what we actually need is a compassionate community. And that doesn't mean that we, we don't value the role of clinicians and people who have therapeutic skills and have training and knowledge. That's all part of the community, but um, we're part of that that continuum of community and and living and working together and and having that awareness that um, trauma is part of our experience yep. and affects all of us in um, different ways is just so important. And um, so for me, that's I think that's that's what sums up this conversation from my perspective, and that brings us back to that shared appreciation for the story that the human being that, that I come into interact with um, repeatedly day in, day out. That's, that's so important. And so for me, um, more than being a psychiatrist or anything like that, I'm, I'm simply another human being and I'm curious and inquiring about the stories of those people who might give me the privilege of being part of their lives and listening to them and their experience. Mm. Yeah, I would say I just I've just loved being able to share stories with you tonight and to listen. Uh, I, I wish we had longer to, to listen to each other's stories because I think we embody uh, hope around healing and hope around what it means to work together. And I'm going to leave tonight with a beautiful phrase that Judy said, which is said to create safe places for stories to come and to help people make sense to reclaim our capacity to grieve and celebrate together. I just was really struck by those words. Judy, you have a way with words and uh, I treasure your phrases and um, that's what I'll be taking from tonight. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, Judy, a last word. A last word to you, I think. If I had a magic wand, I would uh, wave it and tell us all across Australia that we need to just sit together and listen to each other. Mm. And we need to grieve together in crying and uh, finding songs um, mm. and just being together. And I think that we would build a country that we all want to leave to our children and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren into the future. So if I had... That magic wand, I'd say, let's just come on, come and sit with me, sit with me and let's share our stories. And we're doing the work of the so called experts because uh, the stories, as we listen, as we hold each other, that's the healing. Mm. Thank, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I couldn't have hoped for uh, a more stimulating and, and moving uh, session. Uh, and we've had, uh, I hear from uh, the chat room that uh, the audience appreciates your stories, your your compassion, uh, your souls so much. So thank you all. Um, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Mm. So uh, we're not over yet. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, some resources recommended by the panel um, that you can get by clicking on the resources tab top right hand part of your screen trust you can all find that mm. and um, local networking um, this is very important because it allows us to share oh I hope I'm here still. Can you all yes, hear me? Yes, oh, yes. good. Something happened to, you know, something else came up on my screen. So um, uh, the, um, let's throw me for a moment if I can just see if I can bring back the screen. Mm. So you were talking about the, the older person's yeah. networks, Stephen? A absolutely. So I'll come back to, to it even though I can't see you. Maybe you can just move the slides along for me, Julie. 
Um, so the MHPN uh, supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks, which allow much of what, what we're talking about this evening, about sharing, where clinicians uh, from different disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources, build local referral pathways, and engage in CPD activities. Now, our group in Northern Sydney has had a lot of fun running sessions, from sessions on art and music therapy, and film nights, to presentations by psychiatrists and other mental health professionals on the challenges that we all face in our daily work. And we've also had people from community come in and talk about um, their experiences of um, uh, mental health uh, in their lives. So I'd strongly encourage you to join or form an older person's special interest network. And if you're interested, you should make contact with the MHPN, uh, Mental Health Professional Networks, via the network section of the website. Uh, they provide support to run these groups. And um, just want to let you know uh, that there will be two more webinars in uh, 2022 uh, by way of the partnership uh, between uh, the 31 PHNs and the Mental Health Professional Network. So uh, please keep an eye out for future communications. And um, I think the last thing, assuming that that slide's come up, is to encourage you all to fill out the exit survey. We, we really appreciate uh, hearing from you what, um, what you've felt about this evening and uh, your comments in the chat room are very much appreciated and will inform how we uh, plan uh, future webinars. Um, uh, you are the community and um, uh, as I think it's been made clear in this in the last part of the conversation, uh, community uh, is so important in ensuring uh, good care. So um, I uh, thank you all for your attendance and um, I wish you a, a good evening and uh, a, safe, a safe rest of the evening. Thank you very much.